how familiar um, people listening are with, with Massively. I mean, it's worth saying that even among Victorians, um, until I would say relatively recently, you know, when people reel off the regions of Victoria, Macedon would still be not in terms of quality, but just in terms of how present it is in your mind. Um, not one of the first, even top five, probably to spring to mind generally for, for the average person. So j- just give us a sense of how long you've actually been familiar with the land up there. And um, and I guess it's probably worth pointing out as well, some of your peers who you um, who you work with up there and, and the other wineries who have kind of, along with Shadow Effects, led the way in, in finding out you know what what this land up there is 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 worthy of and what it can do yeah well, that's right. some of the vines were planted in the 70s 60s and 70s but and so there are some old vineyards it's up there um, is, and back in the day these vineyards were planted a lot to sparkling places like it was a lot colder back in the 60s 70s and 80s and so they made a lot of sparkling wine. So you probably know that you know, Hanging Rocks sparkling wines were, you know, that's why the Masson Range has really started. And then you've got Lou Knight from Granite Hills, which makes some really cold breezing. But that's a particular site in the Masson Ranges. So, uh, and as it's warmed up a fraction, we've been able to get these lovely Pinots to full maturity of flavour. Uh, and so they've really, the little shift in temperature over the last 30 years has really flourished. Uh, mate, and I think that's why the Masson Rangers has um, sort of um, a, a bit more present in the marketplace because the wines have got better and better as it's warmed up a little bit. Uh, as it's warmed up a little bit, it's, um, you know, we're getting this lovely flavour and, and the wines and the Pinot and the Chardonnay they do um, show coolness but flourish, which is really nice. So, yeah, I mean, people probably know Mass and Rangers, a few of the big towns, for instance. Uh, you've got um, Trentham, Hepburn Springs, so it's in that real spa country. So we get a lot more rainfall than Melbourne. One of our vineyards sits at 800 metres on the side of Mount Massenon. And, you know, we're, we're looking at 1,100 mils a year there of rain, uh, and we're getting a lot cooler days. 25 degree days where it can be 35 in Melbourne. And the higher up you go, you know, the less hot the days are and the cooler the nights are. So, I mean, and there's many different sites. It's, the thing is, that obviously, Yarra Valley is quite well known. There's, it's vineyard up here. The vineyards scattered between little pockets. There's a little vineyard here and a little pocket over here of the vineyard. They're all a little bit different and they show. Uh, different sites and the beauty is because we've got six different sites we can up in Masson you know, we, we farm the region quite and understand the region and the vineyard sites we can put the, uh, quite a complete wine together especially the Chardonnays and Pinots these are both blends blends of vineyards that we make up there so yeah, maybe we'll about- go on to the yeah, sorry Joe keep going Oh, I was, I was just going to say, I think it's it's interesting that I, I encounter, um, you know, like I mentioned it earlier, but um, quite often I think um, people coming into it to specifically seek out Victorian Pinot, Victorian Chardonnay, um, I would say that always, obviously, the light bulb that goes off is, is, is Yarra um, and then Mornington as well. Um, what would you say are maybe, there's got to be some, some pretty obvious climatic differences in the Macedon to say that the are there larger or more popular regions? What what would be sort of the the biggest differences you would see in both vintage and and the wines that come from Macedon in, in comparison to the to the other regions of Victoria? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think eighteen and nineteen. So let's talk about some other big Pinot Noir and Chardonnay producing regions in Victoria, like the Yarra Valley, for instance. The Yarra Valley eighteen was quite warm, considering. Um, both warm, warm in Macedon and Yarra, but you so said the Yarra was picking in early March, uh, even February in 18 and 19, because there was a lot of sun around and it was quite hot. And we were still only just going through the rays at that period. So we were managed to miss the worst of the heat. We were missing the worst of the heat up there um, and getting the, 
the better weather later on. So we're getting the March, late March ripening. So, you know, rather than those hot days around 35, 40 degrees, we're, we're getting the ripening period later in the season. We're, we're into the autumn. And so, you know, we're actually getting the cooler days and cooler days. Up there today, for instance, Melbourne, it was 17 degrees. In the Macedon Ranges, where we're at our Trenton Vineyard, which is Little Hampton, it was uh, it was only 12 degrees up there. So it, it's that different. It's very, it's a very different. You know, it's only less than an hour, 60 cars, it's 740 metres up in the air. You just It's a lot cooler. And so you don't get that sunburn character. You get good growth of the vineyard all through the whole season. Um, my background is in the vineyard, growing vineyards, and, and it's been lovely to see and where it rains and where it, uh, you can control the things a bit better because it's cooler. You know, it's much nice to grow, much nice to grow grapes in a cool place. Anyway, I'll talk about how we make the 18 Chardonnay, I suppose, um, and it, I assume everyone's got a glass or maybe they haven't at home. I don't know, but is that how it works, Joe? Usually you've got a bottle in front of you. I hope you have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if, if I know this lot, they've certainly had at least a glass by now. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> no worries. Well, maybe I should top mine up a bit. <laughs> Uh, a question that I, I would have as well, Al, uh, just before we jump into the Chardonnay, but you mentioned that your background was in um, was in the vineyards. Is has that's been it the whole time? Is uh, you, you've sort of come up through through vineyards and viticulture all, all the way into to shadow facts and, and winemaking? Yeah, definitely. Like I grew up, my family had a vineyard in the Geelong region. We had a winery, also, you know, when I was young, we planted vines and had vineyards and made wine and. I did do the winemaking course in, in Adelaide Uni, but when I first started working at Shadow Facts, I actually ran the vineyards, and I ran the vineyards there for, I don't know, since 2001. I've been there for a while, but uh, and also, but my background in winemaking as well, so I've done the winemaking course, and you know, I do some Jody Melbourne, and so, but if you don't know how to grow grapes, it's very hard to make wine because it's all about growing the grapes, especially in these really cool places. If you don't grow the grapes right, you can't make them. What we do, we don't do any tricks in the winery. It's all naturally wild fermented and there's not, nothing, no tricks. The, the secret is to get the grapes right in the vineyard and pick it at the right time. We've got a good team. So the three of us work in the vineyard and work in the winery. So we're a very small team. So we all know how to what, what we're doing in the vineyard. And so every step we're doing and every every We've lost you, Al. Yeah. Come back. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, you lost me a bit. You bet. Just last last twenty seconds. Oh, it's no good. <laughs> you got me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah got you back. Well, I'll probably got Talking rubbish anyway, so there you go. <laughs> now, quick, quick question more on the history of, of Macedon. Um, I, I guess when or, or yeah, when did you start to see kind of still Pinot Noir and Chardonnay make a breakthrough, even more so in the Victorian market as opposed to the Sydney market? Was there a specific kind of warming event or was there something that went, yeah, Macedon makes good still Pinot? Or good still Chardonnay? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, there was always guys making lovely Chardonnay and Pinot up there, like the likes of Bindi have been around for a long time. And, you know, there's still wines have been, you know, if you think about great Pinot and Chardonnay, they have always done it. That, they've probably been going, what, 30 years now, I suppose. Um, they were planted in 88, I think. Uh, the, the, one of the other vineyards, Kilchurn, have been doing the same. But And then there's obviously Curly Flat as well that, have been making good Pinot for 20 years, I suppose. Um, but that, that's a vineyard just out of Lancefield. So, I mean, I suppose it's really come to the fore in the last, since it got quite hot in those late two, 2000, you know, 2008, 2009 was obviously very hot. People were looking at cooler places. 18 was very hot and dry. The 19 was warm as well. So, I mean, these warmer years, the wines still look restrained and tight. They don't show any hint of overripe character, which I 
bloody mild. Like when I drink Chardonnay or I drink Chablis or I drink Burgundy, you know, you don't want that any of that overripeness. And it's so easy to do that if you get, you know, some really hot sun and, and uh, shriveling at the wrong time, I suppose. Can, can Macedon ever see instances of overripeness or is it a little bit too cold? Sorry, I missed that. Um, it can, have you seen instances of Macedon being like overripe in, in the past or is it, is it sort of much cooler than some of the regions which maybe see it a little bit more? I mean, it's all the same Macedon ranges. There's some sites, you know, down at 300 metres mm -hmm. above sea level and if they're north facing sites and in a very hot year and you don't have your canopy right, yeah, sure, in the vineyard you can get overripe characters, you can get sunburn. Even in Chardonnay, if you pick it too late, you know, you can turn from that beautiful floral character that we get in the Chardonnay, for instance, that the florals, flints, they can turn so quickly into sun cream. Uh, so what sun cream, sort of nectarine, uh, almost you know, uh, more, more riper characters, sort of pineapples, you know. So I think the beauty of the Chardonnay from Mass and Range is if you get it right in the vineyard and you get the picking date right, uh, and you've got your, all your, your um, coverage in the vineyard, your, your management of the vineyard, right? You get this lovely grant, what we call flavours that come from the earth. So the mineral characters, you know, the flints, the, the stones, all that sort of things that we love in sort of Chablis, I suppose. But, you, you know, those sorts of characters. It's there from a cold place. And so when you do it properly and right, I think they, they shine in, in cooler regions. And it, but it's so easy to... You've got to be so careful. If you pick it three days late, you can get into that sun cream, nectarine, uh, and they can blow out, you know, get a bit buttery and alcoholic. Um, so, I mean, yeah, yeah, I have seen it, but, you know, you, you try not to do it. I, yeah. I, think, I think there's been a couple of uh, recent instances in, in Victoria where you've seen a marked difference between what's happened up in, in Macedon, where we've had the Victorian heat spikes in, um, like severe heat spikes, as in 18 down in Mornington Peninsula um, at the end of February. And it's a time where your grapes out up there aren't even thinking about <laughs> finishing the job off. Whereas um, obviously that, that's really skipped things along a heck of a lot in a couple of regions in, in Victoria where grapes have really started to ripen solidly through heat spikes in that early March, uh, late Feb. And then, and as you say, quite often, even Geelong actually has actually sort of pulled it out at the last minute because once those have passed, the weather's, you know, getting mild and you've got those really cool autumn days and you've got a totally different, effectively you're picking your grapes in a totally different season from some of the areas that, um, that ripen a bit earlier. I mean, it makes a huge difference, doesn't it? In a war in a warm season. Yeah, you still got me there. I just I'm frozen up a bit. Oh, you're back. There you go. No, I agree, Ed. Like, for instance, in um, you know, we also make wine out of Geelong. We make Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So, but in 2019, in uh, we picked those Geelong vineyards, which is only an hour from uh, the probably. It, an hour and a half, so 100 k's from the Macedon region. You know, we were picking those in February in 18 and 19, so the last week of Feb. And, you know, it's a six to eight weeks difference, you know, up to in the Macedon ranges. We weren't even thinking about that. We were, we were picking down there. We hadn't put nets on up there, so we're only just changing colour. And it's just that's how vast the difference is um, in there. And it, one year in 2017 when it was a really cool year, so 17 was quite cool. That's when we picked in, in, um, uh, in, sorry, in May, which is rare. But we had nothing to do in the winery, and so we're hanging around. In February came and early March came, and we thought we'd do a trip to Tassie. And we actually went down to Tassie to our friends down there and visited a lot of wineries and vineyards. And, you know, they were changing colour and... They were through Marais on, and none of our vineyards massive and started changing colours. So it is cold. And so when you think about cool climate Pinot, Massillon Ranges is definitely cool climate Pinot and Chardonnay. So anyway, enough about that. 
let's talk about the wines and the wine making, I suppose, a little bit, because we can get caught up in how cool it is. I mean, I just love making wine in the region. But anyway, so let's talk about the Shard. So, I mean, this Shard, so it's all hand-picked Chardonnay. There's three different vineyards here, so hand-picked, you know, it, we only ever pick on taste, uh, so we, we constantly taste every couple of days close to harvest. And we're looking at flavour, so acid balance really. So we, we try and throw our tools away because we get, can get caught up on actual measurements. So we're really looking at when the, when the flavour comes in the, in the Chardonnay grapes. We, and we never want the Chardonnay actual berry to be sunny or any, any uh, yellowing of the, the Chardonnay. So... It's what, when we find it goes, the skin starts to go translucent, that's when we pick the grape. And so when we pick that, that retains its purity. So we're getting lovely fleshy, lovely grapefruit characters, lovely floral sort of citrus notes when we ferment the wine. And so that's all while fermented. We, we Very simple. Bring it into the winery, squeeze it in the press, and it goes straight into our underground uh, where it undergoes wild fermentation. Um, so wild fermentation is the wild, the yeast on the on the vines and in the barrels and in the air. And uh, so there's, there's no tricks in this wine. You know, so it spends about ten months down there in the chills, wild ferments. You know, there may be a couple of barrels that go through secondary fermentation. We don't encourage that. So there may be a, a you know, one out of 10 barrels that go through a bit of malolactic fermentation. We don't encourage it. If it happens, it happens. But, you know, so be it. And so, but the beauty about this one, it gets this lovely, it retains its acidity. So when you look at Masson and Chardonnay, I think it's the depth of flavour. So you've got all this flavour. You've got these concentrations. You've got this grapefruit pith. You've got this drive. You've got this depth of flavour. But it's got really lovely lightness of acidity and, and pithiness to it. So the lovely acid and the drive and the freshness of the wine. That's why I like Massey and Chardonnay, I suppose, when it's done well. So I'll just show you maybe I can, I can, here we go. I'll just show you some underground cellar photos, I suppose, while I'm here. How do we do this? Sorry. Here we go. We'll get there. <laughs> um, quick, quick question on the Malo. Um, yeah. Why, why would it not go through more natural Malo? Or does it, is there, would it, the Malo happen a bit more naturally? Or is it because it's so cold that it just doesn't kind of click in so, or start? Uh, well, we, we don't add any bacteria or anything to it. So it, when it finishes its primary firm, it, it usually uh, – here we go. Hang on. Sorry, I'll just let me share this screen with you. Hang on. Um, a good, good comment came through from Dave in the Zoom chat there that said, the Chardonnay is drinking really nicely. It wouldn't be out of place in bone, um, which I think is, is – oh, don't, don't give him a big head. He's trying to work out the, the technology. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, I, I agree. So let's have a look here. Yeah, here we go. Yep. Sorry, guys. Right, we can we can see it almost now. Mm. But I'm I'm really enjoying the shadow. I really like that um that grapefruit pith sort of note that that you touched on there, and just that really lovely sort of natural acid line and and kind of almost um, really uplifting freshness to that that fruit weight. Mm. Ah, have you got me there now? Uh, not quite. 
<laughs> we had your your folder before. Yeah, it felt like we were close. Oh, right. hmm. <laughs> there we go. Yay. Yeah, so there, I mean, that's the barrel. So, I mean, it's a beautiful spot. So the cellar, I don't know if some of you may not have been to Shadowfax Winery. Some have. So but the cellar doors above the winery here, uh, the, above this hole. So this is underground and the cellar doors are above there. So all the wines, they comes down here after we press the grapes, leave the tank to settle overnight, and they come down here into these barrels go through natural fermentation. Be the beauty of this is it, it stays at a constant temperature of about, you know, 15 degrees, gets down to about 12 degrees this time of year. So it doesn't vary much and, you know, it stops the wines ageing too quickly by being underground and cool. Um, and so is that that's just sort of like the floor underneath the cellar door, is it like it's like one floor underground? Or is it a little bit deeper? Yeah, so that's right, Joe. So the winery's up upstairs as well. And so all the wine gets, it's all gravity fed down into these barrels. So it's a very nice place to work uh, when it's cold or when it's hot outside. So mm. oops. should point out the oh. um, the restaurant is bloody good if anyone ever is down that way. <laughs> it is well, well worth yeah. stop. That's right. So if you're ever on your way from Melbourne to the coast, Geelong uh, or the surf coast, Obviously not now because we've got a few things going on down here at Victoria. But, um, <laughs> next time you're allowed to come down here, please drop in and say yes. I'll just show you. So this is just thought I'd show you some of the vineyard shots. Can you all see that snow photo? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Oh, okay. I think, so I think they, Dave earlier made the comment that it must get pretty cold in the winter. I think, Dave, there's your answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so this is looking back at our little Hampton vineyard, which is where we've got some Pinot Noir planted. So this is uh, this was in, this was last year, but every year we get snow up there in the winter, and so there the vines are uh, some vineyards there. So I mean, that, and that was taken at about ten o'clock in the day, so ten o'clock in the morning. So it is cold, and we get snow. So I'll just. Wow. And the altitude there, Al, remind me, is about, what, seven, just over 700 metres? Yeah, that's 740 metres there. So, I mean, it's one of the cooler sites in the Masson Ranges. But when it's a warm spring day, this is the same site, when it's a warm spring day, uh, and the beauty is it's also got this red soil. So it's I don't know if you can see that, but that's the soil there up in uh, the Little Hampton Vineyard, and that red soil is very rare. At altitude because it's young soil and at altitude usually it gets washed down so red soil at high altitude or any high altitude is rare because as i said it usually gets washed away over years and years so it's quite young and fertile soil there's a combination i believe of altitude and red soil that gets lovely violet and rose hip characters in particular in pinot noir uh, which i'll probably go on to in a sec We'll try the Pinot. Oh, I shouldn't be showing that photo yet. <laughs> and that's actually upstairs <laughs> in the cellar door. That's how we do wine tastings at the moment down in Melbourne or Victoria because things are pretty bloody hairy at the moment down here. So we've got to, got to get our hazmat suits on to do a wine tasting. So. <laughs> yeah. You don't get that in bone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, let me get off that. Okay, you got me back there. Uh, yes, no. we uh, seems so. Harry's disappeared. Harry's disappeared, but we're here. And then, yeah, yep, we got you back. Just need to turn your video back on. Mm. All right, but yeah, no, the Chardonnay. So that lovely pinkiness, that drive, that graph, that grapefruit. We leave that in there on purpose. Uh, sorry, have you got me? We've got. Don't have your video. No, no not your video yet. Uh, uh, I'm there, not there, there you are. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Sorry. Mm. Anyway, so, yeah, that's the Chardonnay. I love the Chardonnay. I think it's just got a bit of flint, a bit of mineral. 
grapefruit, all that sort of the cool climate Chardonnay characters, which I love. Anyway. How, um, how far mate, back do the vintages go on the Chardonnay? How, how long have you been making this, this style or this specific wine? So we started making a, what was it? It's a 2008 Chardonnay from Macedon Rangers. So since then, uh, but we've all had fruit coming in from Macedon for about the last 16 years at Chatterfax. So we do know that we've been dealing with one client up there, Mid Hill Vineyard, which we've now leased over the years. So we, we manage that vineyard and we run it ourselves now. So, I mean, we know these vineyards back to front now, which is good. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of, Al, I don't don't want to annoy you with this, but I was gonna. I think the Chardonnay. I think the twenty eighteen was from Mid Hill Vineyard, Mount Macedon, Spring Hill, Littlehampton. Yep. Uh, uh, that's right, yeah. So just just so for the people, because one thing that really struck me last time I was at Macedon Ranges to come and see your place um, was I think with these a lot of these. I suppose when people think of the Yarra and the Mornington Peninsula, I guess is those sort of reference points for. Victorian Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, you you kind of really know you're in a wine region when you're down here because you see, you know, every few metres you seem to be going past another sign for a winery. Um, what struck me up in Macedon was obviously that you, you're you driving along, you don't see any vines for a long time, and then there's this tiny little pocket up on a hillside um, with uh, a vineyard, and then you don't see another one for, a, you know, a good, good little while. So they're they're really quite scattered, aren't they? And I, and I, I would argue as well that we've seen from tasting a few different wines, like a, quite a bit of sub-regional variation as well. Like it's a very exciting area because it's not, it's not that easy just to blanket. Yeah, the acidity, as you say, is is very um, common, and the um, and the slow ripening, I suppose, complexity that you get. But but in fact, it's a bloody interesting area, and, and it's not about to, um, you know, there's plenty more to discover, isn't there? Oh, definitely. I mean, and that's the thing. All, every vineyard we've got up there is a little bit different. Like you've either got these on the side of Mount Macedon, which is the Mount Macedon vineyard that we get some fruit off, which was planted in the 80s, uh, actually by Olivia Newton-John. So there's some of that in that 2018 Chardonnay. So she planted that Olivia. back. <laughs> and yeah, Olivia Newton-John planted that back in the 80s. I think it was the Koala Blue label yeah. way back in the day. But anyway, that that vineyard up there, it's pure granite soil. It's it's well, it's not soil. It's really granite and it's hard. And it's very cold. It's above the cloud usually that vineyard, and it's a very different place to grow the grapes that we have near Lancefield. That's on red dirt. It's around 50 meters, but you know we we have to shade that more and be very careful not to get too much sun. So we have to grow them very differently. You know, so the the mid hill vineyard gets a lot more nectarine and grapefruit. And the one up on the on the schistier soil, on the harder soil, a lot more flint and mineral characters. So, and that's the beauty of this one. You can see both those in there, and they're coming from two different vineyards. And so, yeah, there's there's so much potential up there, but you've got to be so careful as well, because if you plant on the south side of a hill it, it, without any sun, you won't ripen your grapes. If you plant yeah. too low, you get frosted out. You, you, there is you've got to be very careful where you plant your vineyards up there. It's, and, yeah, there will be more vineyards planted up there, but um, you can't just plant anywhere in the Masson Range. It's all hand done. Everything you've got to do is it's high input bit of culture because it's marginal. You know. What would be your biggest um, pressure in terms of disease or does it sort of differ vintage to vintage? It... Uh, it really does differ vintage to vintage. Mm-hmm. I mean, probably 18 was – there was not – virtually no rain come the growing season, like come the when, once the grapes started growing. So it really depends. And then 17, you can get quite wet. This year in 2020 was one of the hardest I can remember because we had really hot, warm, dry conditions in the spring. And then we had really wet conditions in the growing season. And then we had bloody coronavirus come in the middle of harvest. So it was tricky this year. Uh, however, we got through it. And, you know, with it, without the careful management, of their vineyards, the grapes won't get ripe. So one of the other vineyards, which is also at 800 metres on the side, on the western side of Mount Macedon, um, what we've done there, we do, we strip all the 
the leaves off the bunch zone of the Pinot Noir at before Vraison actually at flowering, which is unheard of in the Victoria. So because it's such a cold site, if we don't do that, we actually don't get enough sun in that vineyard site to ripen the grapes properly. But if we did that on the other vineyard at 300 metres at Mid Hill Vineyard, for instance, we'd cook the grapes. So every single site was oil. All right, so you ready to try the Pinot? Do you want me to talk about the Pinot Noir a bit? I am, I am more than ready. I'm more than ready. I love the way you say Pinot Noir. <laughs> AIDS has already moved onto it. Very good. I've moved onto it as well. Um, I will probably drink all of the Chardonnay at, at one point, though. Yeah. Not I mean, an absolute it's treat. hard to pass the Chardonnay. Yeah. You can <laughs> drink it. And it is, I mean, I'll drink a bit more of that later because mm. I do think it, the, the freshness and the vibrancy, you can drink more than a glass. You can drink more than half a bottle. You can drink yeah. a bottle, I suppose. But anyway, that's not a healer. But the 19 Pinot, so 19 Pinot is a blend of vineyards as well. But there's a few things I love about this as well. It's only just been released. But if, uh, hang on, sorry. Um, what I see there. Lost you again. Yeah, I'm frozen. Stuck in time. Um, wow. This Pinot, even after the, what, 40 minutes since I opened it before this, looking incredible. But he's, he's got that good point of that blue fruit, not that, like, red cherry and red kind of fruit drive. It's got that. It's still quite a dense blue fruit, but it's not that like plush, yeah. soft. It's a fruit. it's actually just a glorious peanut to smell. Alex has just made the comment, just had a sniff. <laughs> but it really does, it does have that lovely, you know, it's got a, a full, you know, range of aromas on it. It's really pretty. Yeah. Again, what I find quite captivating um, is that it, it, it really sets its own mark for for Victorian Pinot, not necessarily following the 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 mold of, of the other, I guess, larger regions. Um, there's that blue fruit, that cassis, that mm. cooking spice towards it. Really, really delicious. Well, w while Al's um, frozen and can't, <laughs> and can't tell me to shut up about how cold it is up there, I do think <laughs> for, me, for me, with, with Pinot especially, the absolute key is that slow ripening period that you get because everyone always you know remarks obviously that it's it's tricky to, to grow and that's before you start making wine with it but for me you know you know we it can develop quite a lot of sugar and quite high alcohol and quite a lot of sweetness quite quickly and where where it becomes uninteresting is where it becomes very one-dimensional effectively in that really red fruited sweet um pleasant but um but one dimensional way, I think, you know, when it, when it fails and when it really turns into something glorious, it's when you've got that real spread of flavors, that spread of aromas and that also that spread of tannin because it's, you know, it's got the potential to really cling and have that peacock's tail finish. And I think that, that that's something you really do find in places where it, it ripens slowly. Yeah. I think I see that as well in, in Pinot and that, that, that almost, I think it, it's gathered all of this, this fame and prestige from some of the, the great, great, great wines um, produced across the world here in Australia and France and those countries alike. But all of those great wines that have put Pinot Noir into this, you know, um, amazing, amazing, great. They're wines that you need to put away for quite a long time to you really sort of see the full expression. Um, yet most of the Pinot that we consume in Australia is drunk the night of purchasing or the weekend of purchasing. So it's kind of interesting to, to think of Pinot as, as um, uh, you know, the, the incredible and amazing, yet drink it instantly, um, yep. which I think is, is 
quite special. But this, this to me, yeah, just like like I said, layers and 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 waves of aroma and complexity and, and spice. Um, and um, yeah, well, I guess while we're sorting out the um, technicalities, it's it's interesting to hear feedback from um, from everybody in the Zoom chat, and 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 they're enjoying it as well. Um, yeah, Dave, Dave would like to find out the Pinot clones, um, which I think would be interesting to see as well. What the, what sort of clones they have decided to go with in those in the cooler area, whether it's it's your triple um, sevens and and that sort of thing or MV sixes, but I can't imagine. It's, yeah, yeah. I'm afraid it's a question I can't answer. Actually, the clone yeah. <laughs> makeup. There's four, there's four different vineyards again. I think in the Pinot from 2019. It's not the same four as. It's, I think three of those are the same as the Chardonnay and one of them is different. Um, also all, all whole berry ferment here. So I think those are, that's a quite a key in the wine that it's these stems. So there's no whole clusters. Um, but at the same time, the whole berries just tend to really give that lovely rounded, super perfumed, um, really integrated mouthfeel um which is which is part of the wine but but interestingly with the lack of whole berries you still uh, sorry of whole bunches it's still got that really nice sort of earthy thing and definitely the, the tannin from those grape skins is i think lovely yeah i think the tannin it, it comes across really understated in this wine but sort of picks right up at the end there which is quite which is you know the opposite of of the the those um more one-dimensional styles you were, you were touching on earlier where it's sort of all the fruit, all the acid, all the tannin right up front, but yeah, really lacks that, that depth. Hey, he's back. Sorry about that. That's, That's all right. right. We can hear you. Oh, I got you. <laughs> hey. well, the computer just shit itself, but there you go. <laughs> I'm back. So You're sorry, back. I missed all that. I hope you described the Pinot Noir well, Ed. Uh, I did. I did my best. I um, we did have a question about your clonal um, makeup up in Macedon, whether it's um, it mirrors you, others or whether it's. I mean, you've got four vineyards, I think, again in play here. So presumably a, a, a bit of a a clonal smorgasbord. But um, but Dave was just asking which clones you tend to favour. What works well up in Macedon? What did you say? The clones. Of... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so. There's a few different clones in this blend. Uh, there's probably 25% MV6, there's some D5, uh, V12, which is originally a, a uh, originally a sparkling based clone, but it does work well now in, up there as well. But that, that's a little bit more sort of primary fruit characters. The MV6 has a bit more brooding characters, a bit darker. Um, we also have some triple seven. And we have a pomade clone as well. And so they add a bit more spice and those sorts of things. We've also got some 114 and 115. They add some um, blue fruit characters, I suppose. I mean, they're very simple answers to that. But yeah, yeah, of course. You know, it really does depend on each vineyard. So, but I mean, my, what I love about this wine is it's got this lovely flourish on the palate. It's, it's got this lovely drive the, the tannin ripeness is um is what i really like so the tannin ripeness you can tell i call it vineyard tannin and it's i call it grown tannin so because of that cool climate up there you know you've got this lovely coating on, on the front to the back of your palate um you know there's no hardness to it there's no there's no fakeness to it the real uh grape grown derived tannins there's no tricks here it's just hang time on on the vineyard so that's what I like. But, I mean, the aromatics, as I said, I don't know what you were saying when I was off, offline, but the purity of Master and Ranger's Pinot is what I love. I love blue fruits. I love violets. I love there's a bit of darkness. There's this bit of this natural spice. So there's this cardamom sort of cinnamon spice that comes from the coolness of the region. We don't use any whole bunches in this wine. So a lot of other regions and a lot of other producers use whole bunches to get that spice. But because... It is quite cool in some of these sites. It does have this natural spice that that we really love. So when we make the wine, it's what we call it's 100% whole 
berries. So we keep all the whole berries and they're all open fermenters. So the whole berries, we get a little bit of carbonic maceration happening, but without the stem. So you do get that lovely blue fruit purity, I suppose. Um, but once again, there's no tricks with this. It's We pump it over very gently in open fermenters and then back down into the barrel room. I think this wine's got 25 to 30% new wood, depending on how you measure it. Um, you know, and that just adds a little bit of that sort of cardamom, that darker spice, that uh, iodine character, which I like. But this, this has only just come on the marketplace, and I reckon there's not too many Pinots that will look this cool in 2019, as in mm. it's got purity, it's got vibrancy, it's got, you know, blue fruit characters. Uh, because it was so cool in mass and ranges, we got the best of the weather up there, which was nice. A quick, quick question Al, on your oak use. Um, do you mix it up with different size barrels or are you getting into that at all or are you pretty? No, no. I mean, we, we've gone away from two, the smaller size barrels. So we use hogsheads and now we use it, which are 300 litres. So traditionally, uh, Burgundy producers used to use 225 litre barrels. Uh, we, we've gone up to hogsheads, 300 litres. We just don't. We want it, and that we've found that that there's less air going into the wine, so they retain its purity. I mean, masculine's about the purity, so the bigger the format, we've found that we can retain that purity for longer. Then we get it bottled fresh, and we have that in the in the wine when you, when you guys taste it. And then we've also got the 500s because the surface area and volume ratio, you get less air intake. So we're using a lot more 500s now, which are the punches. So they're a bit hard to handle because you know. We're, we do it all downstairs and handle them on our own. But, you know, we're big boys and we can handle it. So, anyway. Is there anything, um, mostly in the pier, but also in, in the, I guess, any, any of the wines that you make that, um, is there any sort of inspiration or, or techniques or anything that you have um, seen in, in other wine producing regions across Australia or the world that have maybe made it into the, the Shadow Facts repertoire? Oh, definitely, like 100%. Um, I think I've worked in Italy and two of my offsiders, they work overseas every year. One works in Italy as well and the other guys have been to Burgundy. One's work, He's worked in um, in New Zealand in, and making Pinot Noir and up in, in America as well. But one thing we've found... We got a lot out of going to Tassie. It was probably the, some of the coolest places in Tassie. Like I think we're similar sort of to the Huon Valley, about that temperature. And some of the grape growing uh, techniques, I suppose, we found more of adopted. I suppose like like that. Uh, what I spoke about the um, leaf plucking at Faraison mm -hmm. and the leaf plucking even at flowering, which is very rare in, on the mainland. And I learned that from a, a mate of mine down in Tassie who grows some really good stuff. Uh, and it just it really helped one of our vineyards. I wouldn't do it in any other vineyards, just one of the vineyards, which is really cool. But, you know, and I, we drink widely as well. And, you know, we, we try wines that we know how they're made. And we do this Pinot Noir workshop every year, which all Victorian, well, not all, there's about 70 Victorian winemakers get together for three days. It's not happening this year because of, obvious reasons but um you know i've been doing that for the last 10 years and we all look at our wines blind and we all judge them um and we get every year we learn a little bit there some techniques we like some techniques we don't like but the big thing i have sort of taken on board is this whole berry thing i suppose and really the removal of the whole bunch in macedon what i found is well we used to use some macedon we used to use some whole bunches in our pinot in macedon back in the day over the years, we, we just don't get consistency of flavour, I suppose, in cooler years and in hotter years. And wines vary year to year too much. And we get the natural spice anyway from the whole uh, whole berries. Because it's so cool, we get that sort of dried herb sprinkling. So, I mean, uh, yeah, we do learn different techniques. I'm not going to jump in and say, oh, make it like they make it there or make it like they make it there. We've really forged our own path. And every vineyard, we do something a little bit different. Every, you know, every wine we do a little bit different. So 
I suppose, yeah, we take things on board definitely, but you know, you sometimes just got to have the confidence to do uh, what you think's right. I was, I was just going to vouch because obviously Al has an account with um, Seller Hand of his own uh, that he does drink widely. Um, but I have I have noticed, you know, there's a fair <laughs> bit, there's a there's a fair bit of um, in 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 what you what what I've seen you. Uh, refer to and and i suppose order and drink is a lot of wines like shabley some special sort of riesling producers that are very particular and i reckon one thing that i've noticed about shadow facts just um up in macedon and the way that you talked about things it's just working out working out really what your strengths are and not doing you know not doing things because they could add something but just really just learning what you're pairing back because where your real advantages are and i think that that's when you know, when you've got a wine on song and the Shadow Facts pinnacle Pinot Noir is the Little Hampton Pinot Noir, which I reckon is just the most precise, among the most precise fine-tuned Pinots that I've seen in a really short space of time. So I guess that that awareness um, that you have of what a winery, what an estate does when it's really honed in on precisely what it's, where the real advantage is, where the real X factor in its wines is, and then really working to that. Um, and it, it really shows, I think, in the Pinot. As you say, in that, sometimes that's more about taking away than, or often it's about more about taking away than trying to beef, beef something up or work something in. Oh, definitely. And, um, and you know, we, we, it's hard to do nothing. And it's very easy as a winemaker to do something. And the little hand and one of the Pinots, this Pinot is pretty, very pared back. Like, we don't plunge it, we don't work it, we don't add a lot of... Um, and add much yeast and we don't add any uh a lot of wood and you know it's a, and the little hampton pinot noir is even more pared back there's no new wood in that and we're really trying to highlight that vineyard site so to do less in the winery is actually harder you, you want to do things but one thing i have learned is sometimes less is more and you know time will take its course and yeah sure you make mistakes and you fuck some wines up from time to time but we don't bottle those. We sell them to someone else who wouldn't know the difference. So, and hopefully we don't do too many. Um, uh, you got a question from Dave uh, about what other wines in the Shadow Facts range you're excited about in the current release. So apart from anything else, you've got a couple of other oh. Western Ranges wines. Uh, what was that, the question about? Yeah, so we've got a our... Little Hampton single vineyard Pinot Noir, which I really love. The 2018 uh, is still available. With, I reckon it's a ripping wine. It's a, very much in that rose hip character, very fine, lacy tannins. It's more feminine, more feminine than this blend, I suppose. Uh, but just really pure and precise. So that's from our 740 metres above sea level site, close plant vines that we own. Uh, there's also another you've got to look at for a new release coming out. It's just come out. Uh, which is the Straws Lane Vineyard, which is a side of Mount Macedon, a vineyard planted in the 80s as well, close planted again. Uh, it's just a bit harder. You got me? Still got me? Yeah, still got you. Yeah, that's another Pinot, the Straws Lane Pinot from 19. You're talking about. Yeah, so that's another wine that we've got. Which So I really love making Pinots and drinking Pinots. So they're two new Pinots that I suppose will be out and about. You may see them. You go to our yeah. website, Joe may have some. Yeah, actually, while, but, um, while, you mention, while, while Al mentions it, um, there's a, um, so in, from, from up in Macedon, we've got uh, uh, the Pinot Gris, which is uh, very good, but there's also Gewurz growing up there, which is a, you know, kind of uh, the, uh, yeah, yeah, right. the outlier in the um, in the range, really, because you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect a most of the range is um, Gewurz necessarily. But when I first saw the, analytical numbers on the wine i wrote to al and said i think you've made a mistake i'd assume that he just copied the wrong ones because the the acidity levels on this grape variety which is famed for being low and often you know quite flabby and low in acidity were just off the chart and i was like i think you've got you've just obviously copied and pasted the wrong the wrong number um but it's one of the freshest most racy gewurz you, you could ever have it's delicious again massive and coolness yeah, that's right. I mean, you think about where where it grows, and maybe. Oh, I 
did cut and fine tune their cold places. They retained their acidity, they got purity, and they've got, you know, a little bit of zest. So, I mean, it, it's got to be cold to grow those wines. Mm. And that's why our Pinot Gris does well as well up at, Matt, at the Little Hampton Vineyard because it is cold up there. And, you know, we can keep that acid, acid and purity and drive without them getting flabby and, you know, just Pinot Gris sort of flabbiness that they can get. So, yeah, it's definitely a cool place and a nice place to grow grapes. Now, we did actually have a question come through as well from AIDS who um, I know that this, this is uh, really excites me because it, it does reference probably one of my favourite movies of all time. But he says, I'd like to know a bit about where the name Shadowfax came from. I can't Ooh. work it out. And yeah, Harry, I another proud yeah. Kiwi, has jumped in there as well. But, um, yeah. Well, I reckon usually when you ask this question, they know the answer already. So <laughs> uh, Shadowfax Winery is next to the National Equestrian Centre in Werribee. That's where the actual winery is. And uh, Shadowfax is Gandalf's horse out of Lord of the Rings. And Shadowfax was created before the movies came out. This was back, back in the day, so you actually had to read the book. So... Yeah, it is uh, Gandalf's horse and a lot of things. So the king of all horses. We're next next to the Na National Equestrian Centre. So there you go. It, on the website, there was something about the it uh, graceful during the day and unseen during the night, or something like that. Um, but yeah, well, I, I don't a, know. I think Ed's seen my dancing late at night, and it's not. <laughs> yeah, it, it wants to be. It should be unseen. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's always matched with a very flamboyant shirt. Always, <laughs> always, always a good shirt. Uh, the, the, I, I did have a question. Um, I just, uh, as the last sort of hour has has piqued my fascination even further with the Massadon Rangers. But is there anyone, Al, that that you sort of maybe um, have seen the wines from, or, or uh, other producers in the like small producers in the region that particularly excite you and you think are doing very good things from Macedon as well? Oh, definitely. Uh, I mean, I reckon some of Bindi's wines are some of the best wines in, in the country. Uh, and he's got this purity and, and drive and Pinot Noir, you know, you want to drink them. You know, they're a little bit different to our wines, but I, I enjoy drinking them and I like comparing our wines to the other guys that go unnoticed a bit from time to time is um, which fills are in their Rieslings, a very well priced. Old 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 old. Yeah. Have you got me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, not Granite Hills Riesling. Hills. Great producer. Uh, Good Hanging Rock there makes well. some lovely wines. Yep. The Hanging Rock makes some lovely wines. There's a blend there, there's a good value. Cheaper blend, they make it's fantastic. It's called Jim Jim. And then, of course, my mate who I used to work with at Chatterfax for a long time, Matt Harrop's gone to Curly Flat. And, you know, those wines have never been better. So there is some exciting things happening happening in Mass. I drink the wines often, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I, I do Lion's Wheel up there, for instance. There's another small guy that's got a lovely Gamay coming out which is new, very bunchy and zesty. So, yeah, there's new things and there's some exciting stuff going on up there. Yeah, we, we carry the Lionsville Gamay and it, it is outstanding. Really, really It's good. actually in, in the alternative universe where uh, before everything got cancelled, we were supposed to be around about this time coming up to Sydney with Al, uh, Matt from Curly Flat, Michael from Bindi and Josh Cooper, I think, on a on a little foray to go, and, to go and tell people where the hell Macedon Rangers was. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we, yeah, we, so we've done it over Zoom. Hopefully we've, uh, we've, we've accomplished it. Um, but no, there's a, yeah. I mean, there's a good little band of people up there for sure. Really, really pushing boundaries. Some, some great wines and good, good friends of, mm. good friends of yours. Yeah. I mean, and, and the thing is you don't see them that often in the larger bottle shops. You've got to go to these independents like Joe's place um, because there's only 1,500 tonne on average grown from the Macedon Range, which is tiny. It's one of the smallest regions in the country. So the, there's little gems when you find them and you go, geez, why isn't there more? Well, there's not more because it's hard and, and it's, uh, it's tricky to grow the grapes and, uh, you know, it, it's high input viticulture. You've got to put it in the vineyard to get, to get the, the results you need in the wine. So, you know, it scares bigger companies. There's not too many bigger companies there in Mass and Rangers because 
you just get scared off. Like the cost of production is high. Um, but yeah, I suppose that's that's why. But the be- when people do clear because the wines are unique, they're they've got vibrancy and freshness and they've got length. So oh, yeah, Massillon's really cool place. So keep an eye out for it. Yeah, I'm de- definitely definitely excited on the on the region and, and these wines in particular. So both the the Chardy and the Pinot are outstanding. Oh, well done. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, if, if anyone's got any further comments in the in the Zoom chat or um, anybody else coming through, um, Juliana's up to her usual games of um, cooking uh, dinner that will make us all incredibly hungry and probably better food than we've all eaten in the last week um, with a, a roast milk fed lamb and veggies and pesto to match the Pinot, um, which sounds like a match made in heaven, I will say. Uh, and Dave has has pre-warned us that he's going to ask his question about climate change. Um, it sounds like this is a region that will be able to cope with it. So I'm, I'm interested to, to hear that one as well. Yeah, do you want me to answer 